our message this morning. The title of our message this morning is Entering Your Promised Land. Amen. Entering Your Promised Land. Mind you that we do have a promised land that is waiting for us in heaven. Amen. But you know what? We also have a promised land that, is, that, that was stored up for us in this world as well. As we read through the Word of God and we see the Israelites coming out of Egypt, heading towards to their promised land, I believe that God also have a promised land for each and every one of us. Amen. Jesus prayed when He prayed to the Father. He said, Father, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, but Thy will be done on earth as it's in heaven. Amen. And I believe that when the will of the Father is done through us on this earth, you're actually living in your promised land. Amen. But today I want to bring this story, the story of Joshua. Amen to encourage us this morning and to get us a little bit more understanding in the spiritual realm to know that promised land that God has already stored up for you. Amen. Before we get to the Word, let us pray. Father, I pray for your spirit and power. Pray for your anointing, Father God. Fill this place, Father God. Lord, I pray that you will speak directly to our heart. Lord, I pray that you will soften our hearts this morning to receive your Word, Father God. And I pray that you will use me as a vessel this morning, Father God, to speak your Word, Father God. We give you all the glory in your name, we pray. Amen and amen. The title of our message is Entering Your Promised Land. And I felt that the message this morning is a continuation of the series of message that we have been hearing in the last few weeks. I remember Brother Sione, he spoke a message, uh, uh, hold your boast or stand strong, be courageous for the Lord, amen, bambalela unto Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then a week later, uh, I spoke a message about a young rich ruler that went up to Jesus and he asked the question, Jesus, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus sort of showed him this spiritual mirror, which is the law of Moses, that we looked at at this spiritual mirror and we reflect on our life and we examine ourselves and we see the standard of God and we say, there is no way we can make it to heaven in our own ways, in our own work. Amen. But because this young rich ruler, he was so confident, he jumped off his feet and he said, well, I kept that since I was a little boy. Amen. And then Jesus spoke directly to his heart and he exposed the condition of his heart. His dependency was on his wealth. Amen. And then last week we heard uh, Pastor Sile spoke about the, the, uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Amen. Coming out of the land of slavery, heading towards their promised land. Amen. And, and this morning we're going to hear about the promised land. Amen. Now, turn your book with me to Joshua chapter 1, Joshua uh, chapter 1, read from verse 1 all the way to verse 9, amen. I want to read uh, the word this morning to bring our, the context of our message. And it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross to the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot. And, and, and as I promised to Moses, your testimony, uh, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river to the Ephrates and to the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will stand against you uh, on, on the days of your life as I w- was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and be courageous because you will lead these people into the inherent land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my, my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Um, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosper and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. Hallelujah. 
I want you to take, I want to take your focus this morning into the spiritual realm to grasp our understanding on how this story can be of any relevance to our spiritual walk in this present age. Amen. As we read through the story here, we find that Moses, a great man of God, a faithful servant of the Lord, a man of courage that was used by God in a mighty way to showcase his miracle working hands to Pharaoh and to the Egyptian, his journey in this life has now come to an end, amen? But it wasn't the end of his story, which we will connect back to it at the end of our message this morning. So the Israelites is going through a hard time. They're going through a loss. They've just lost their go-to man. They've just lost their, their hero. They've just lost Moses, their deliverer, because Moses was the one that God appointed to go and save the Israelites or take them out of Egypt from the place that they were oppressed and held captive for 400 years. Amen. So it was a hard time. It was a difficult time for the Israelites because they know how much Moses loved them. Amen. If you were here in our Bible study, you would have discovered this story. There was a time that God came and he said to Moses, I'm going to wipe the Israelites out of the face of the earth. Amen. And it's not because God has rejected his people, but simply because of the sin that they have caught up with. But then Moses stood in the camp and he interceded and he said, God, please don't do that. He cried out to God, say, God, if that's the case, please take my name out of the book of life, but let these people leave. Amen. So you can see how much Moses loved his people. Amen. And, and, and the work that Moses have done for the people of Israel. Amen. But at this point of time, his journey has come to an end. Amen. And, and now Joshua is stepping out to lead the people into the promised land. Amen. So, but throughout this transitioning, I want you to uh, have a focus in the spiritual realm because throughout this transitioning, it really paints a great picture of what, uh, um, which reveals the fulfillment of God's promise through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you see it from a spiritual uh, perspective this, mo this morning, Moses was the representation of the law. Amen. He was the one that God gave the law on Mount Sinai, and he was to communicate the law to the people. Amen. And mind you, we've got to remember this, that the law represents the standard of God's righteousness. Amen. The law represents the standard of God's holiness. Amen. The God that we serve, he's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He's a powerful God. Amen. And the law really represents to us how holy the God that we serve. Amen. Because if you read through the book of Exodus 19, before the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, God said this to the people. He, he communicated this to Moses and said, Go and tell the people to consecrate themselves today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because by that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. Amen. And then God also warned Moses. He said, tell the people don't force their way out to see the Lord because they will perish there. Amen. He said, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Amen. So God was warning Moses and the Israelites that in my presence, in my holiness, in my righteousness, no imperfection can enter. Amen. So the people must consecrate themselves. They must be ready. And the Bible says, on that third day, amen, I'm reading from Exodus 19, it says, on that morning on the third day, there was thunder, there was lightning, there was thick cloud over the mountain, and there was very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp, they were trampled. Amen. They were trampled with fear. And then verse 17 says, Then Moses lead the people out to the camp to, to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Amen. And, the, and, and verse 18, it says, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it with fire. The smoke built it, uh, uh, built it up from like a smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain was trampled. Violently, amen. The whole mountain was trampled violently, which, which it really uh, tells us that the presence of God is so heavy. 
is so powerful, amen, that the Israelites could not just walk into the presence of God at this point of time, that even the mountain, the Bible says that even the mountain trembled violently, amen, that tells us that in the presence of God, even creation bowed down to the, to, to the majestic power of the King of kings and the Lord of lords that we serve, amen, so God is, is a mighty God. Amen. He's showcasing to us through, through Moses how great and how powerful he is. Amen. And remember, this is before the law was, re, uh, before the grace was revealed. Amen. And if we have a little bit of a study about Moses, Moses in the Hebrew language or the meaning of the name Moses is taken out or draw forth. Amen. And remember the law, as I mentioned previously, that the law is a spiritual mirror that we look at it and we see the standard of God's righteousness. We see the standard of God's holiness. And then we say to ourselves, there is no way I can keep the law. There is no way I can live up to God's standard. There is no way I can live up to God's holiness. So the, the, the matter and fact is, we need a Joshua, amen. We need a Joshua, amen. Because as the law tells us, you know the law is very important in putting our trust in God, amen. Because the law tells us that there is sin. It gives us the knowledge of sin. Without the law, we wouldn't know what sin is, amen. But when we looked at it, we know that there is sin. And because we know that the Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, so we have fear in our heart. We don't want to die. Amen. And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. And the moment we put our faith in God, that's when wisdom comes among us. That's when the Holy Spirit comes among us. And then what the Holy Spirit do, it, it leads us into the grace of God. Amen. And the name Joshua, the name Joshua, amen, in the Hebrew language, it, it derived from the word Joshua. Amen. It derived from the word Joshua, meaning God is deliverance. God is deliverance. Amen. And Moses here, Moses' death here in this passage of Scripture that we just read, it signified to us that the law cannot take us to the promised land. The law cannot take us to the promised land. We need a Savior. We need a Deliverer. We need a Yeshua. Amen. We need a Yeshua in our life. Amen. And you know, when we read through the Old Testament, we see Egypt. And Egypt is a picture of the world. Amen. And let me tell you something this morning, that as long as we are in Egypt, we will never experience the, the blessings of God that has stored up for us in the promised land. Amen. And when I'm talking about blessings this morning, I'm not just speaking about materialistic blessings. I'm speaking about the righteousness of God that we find in the promised land. Amen. I'm speaking about the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Amen. Which is something that it cannot be taught. It's only when we get to that place and we get to experience the peace of God. Because Jesus said to his disciples in John 14 verse 27, that the peace that I give you, the world cannot give to you. Amen. The, the peace that I give you, the world cannot give to you. When I'm talking about the, uh, the, the, the blessings of God in the promised land, I'm talking about the joy of the Lord. Amen. That joy, it cannot be controlled by our emotions. Amen. When there's good season, we, 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 feel, we, feel, we feel happy. When it's bad season, we feel sad. But the joy of the Lord, it gives us the strength in whatever season of life. Amen. And you can only find that when you experience God in the promised land. Amen. But unfortunately, we cannot make it with the law. Amen. We need a Yeshua. We need a savings plan. Amen. And that's what we are going through this morning. Amen. The book of Romans chapter 8 verse 1, it says that there is no condemnation in those who are in Christ. Amen. And condemnation is the guilt of sin. Amen. And I've seen people travel the world. I've seen people going around just to find that place of serenity where they can connect to nature and find that inner peace in their soul. And let me tell you something. We can travel the whole wide world. You might find that peace temporarily. But Jesus said that the peace that I give you, the world cannot give to you. Amen. We can only find that peace in the promised land where you find the presence of God. Amen. Hallelujah. God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. 
Now you and these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. Amen. And notice something. That our journey, like the journey of the Israelites from Egypt to the promised land, it really signifies our journey from the world to where we are now. Amen. I know some of us here, we're already in our promised land. Amen. And that's something I cannot tell you. You experience that yourself and you will see the presence of God move in a mighty way. And our journey from Egypt to the promised land, Egypt represents the world. Amen. The place where we held captive with sin. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there is no one is perfect, amen. We all need a saving grace, amen. And then as the Israelites left the place of Egypt and going into the wilderness, the wilderness we find as we read through the story today, that it's a place of consecration, amen. It's a place of purification. It's a place of sanctification. This is where we put our faith in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. And the blood of the Lamb will wash us and we, we confess with our mouth that Jesus has rose from the death and we believe in the sacrifice that he did on that cross. And through the wilderness, through this place, we will come. We will come to purify ourselves through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we find that the Israelites is about to cross the Jordan River. Amen. God say, cross, uh, get ready to cross the Jordan River. And anyone notice what happened at the Jordan River? At the River Jordan is the place where Jesus was baptized. Amen. And that signifies to us the baptism that we go through the water, amen, the baptism in the water, amen. What, what is that tells us? It's a declaration of our faith. We're actually telling the world that I'm a new creation in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's actually you're declaring that I'm no longer leave, but Christ leave in me. That's a tomb, a water tomb that we have buried our old person and a new person has been resurrected in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we continue to journey on to our promised land, let me remind you, when you get to that place, we're going to see some trials coming our way. We're going to see the walls of Jericho. Amen. And that's the trials. That's the testing of our faith. And so, uh, uh, unfortunately, some Christians, they fail to, to, to cross over to the promised land because they stop here at the wall of Jericho. And sometimes God allow us to go through trials, amen, because he's teaching us something in our lives, amen. Sometimes he's teaching us about perseverance, amen. When he brings trials in our life, he's teaching us about patience, amen. Sometimes when he brings trials in our life, he's, he's teaching us uh, uh, about having our full trust in our Lord Jesus Christ because at the wall of Jericho, the Israelites didn't have to climb the wall, amen. God was the one that came down and he, he crushed down the walls of Jericho. Amen. And when you get to that place, when you are about to cross over and you see, there's something significant that we find here when the Israelites got to that place and they were about to attack the Canaanites and, 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 and take and claim the land, the promised land where the Bible says that there flows with honey and milk. Amen. So as they were about to attack, the Bible says that, uh, that Joshua sent uh, uh, spies to go and spy the land. Amen. And surely these spies came back and said that the land is filled with honey and milk. Amen. It's flow with honey and milk. But the thing is, there was, um, when people heard that the Israelites is about to attack, they were trampled with fear. And there were some, you know, like uh, giant looking uh, uh, soldiers. They were uh, coming to attack the spies. Amen. And then a woman named Rahab. Amen. We, we heard of this last week as well. Rahab, she was, she was a sinner. She was a prostitute. And, and, and what she did, she stepped up and she, um, she helped the spies. She hid away the spies. Amen. And the, and the Canaanites um, could not fi find him. So then... When, uh, when, when these men were about to return back to the Israelites' camp, they made an oath. They made an oath with Rahab, amen, because Rahab was begging the man to say, we heard of your God. We heard how powerful your God is. We, we heard of the things that he has done to all the nations that you guys cross over. We, we know how powerful. And she was trampled with fear, and she said, please, when you come, when you come to claim the land, please save me and my family. And then these, these men made an oath with her and say, and swear with her that um, unless we enter, unless when we enter the land, you have to tie the scarlet cord in the window through you will lead, uh, 
which you have led us down. And unless you brought your whole father, mother, your brothers, and your family into the house, you will not be saved. Amen. And you know what? I looked at this, and I remember, you know, when we, when we get to that point, you know, of course, when we're coming through our honeymoon with Christ, there's going to be some great joy there. But when you get to that, when you get to face the walls of Jericho and trials comes in your life, amen, here the scarlet call, it, it, it signifies something uh, uh, biblical. It says that the Bible mentioned the scarlet thread as part of the tabernacle curtain, which is, it says in the book of Exodus 20, 26, 1, along with the thread of gold, blue, and purple, and scripture does not comment on the significance of the colors in the curtains or the ephod, but some commentators summarize that the gold, blue, and purple foreshadow Christ's glory, his heavenly origin, and his kingly position. Amen. While the scarlet thread represents Christ's atoning work on the cross through the shedding of his blood. Amen. And the thing is, when you get to that place when you're about to claim your promised land, the devil is going to come back to you. Because the Bible says, Jesus said, when, when one demon left the house, he's going to go and bring another seven demons. Amen. And the devil is going to come seven times stronger to destroy you, to take you down, to destroy your family. Amen. But let me remind you, as we looked at at, at, at this story of the Israelites when they were about to cross the, the promised land. And once again, those voices has come again. Remember, those people, of course, the land is flow with milk and honey, but there's some giants there. It, they will look at us like grasshoppers. Amen. But let me remind you, when you get to that place, the reason why that scarlet coat was there is to remind you that God will fight the battle for you. That Jesus have already won the victory for you. That God have already empowered you, give you the authority, amen, to step on scorpions and snakes, amen. Because when that one demon left, he's going to come seven times. But let me remind you, there's a story in the Bible when Jesus turned up and there was a man that was held up and possessed with 6,000 demons. And with just one word that Jesus said, the Bible says these demons flee. Amen. And let me remind you, the devil's going to come seven times stronger. But the power that is in you, it can cast out more than 6,000 demons. So we don't need to worry about the devil. We don't need to worry about Satan and his team and those giants. All we have to do is just look at that scarlet coat. All we have to do is just look at the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ and remind ourselves that God has given us power. He has given us authority so no weapons will form against Against us will prosper, for we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. You need to remind yourself. You need to encourage yourself. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise the standard against him. We're not going to raise the standard against the devil. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. And that's the power that God wants to, to, wants to remind us this morning. Amen. Because there is a reason why that scarlet God was hanging on that wall of Jericho. And not only that, but it saves the household of, uh, um, of Rahab. Amen. So God uh, told the Israelites, he, 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 he told Joshua, keep the book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosper and success. Amen. When we get to our promised land, we got to remind ourselves, we need to go back to the Word. We need to remind ourselves of the Word day and night. Meditate on it. Because the enemy is going to come, and one thing that he wants to do is to take that seed away from us. The Word of God that planted in our hearts. Amen. But as we read the Word, as we meditate on the Word, as we take it among ourselves, that will actually give us the strength to press on in this life. Amen. That will give us the strength to press on on this life. Because fast forward the story, when the Israelites made it to the promised land, and it's about 20 or 30 years odd later, the people once again forgot about God. We're people. We actually forget things. Amen. They forgot about God. They forgot about what God has done to them 40 years through the wilderness. And then Joshua, he went back to the Word 
and he brought up the law, and he once again read it out to the people. And then he say, he swear in front of the people and say that you choose today who you worship. If you're going to worship the God that your ancestors worship in Egypt, or you're going to worship the gods that your forefather worship in the wilderness, but they all died there. But today, Joshua say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. And you know when you get to your promised land, it's going to be, comf- you know, it's going to be comfortable there. Because it's a land of honey and milk. Amen. And sometimes we will quickly forget God. But God reminds Joshua to meditate on his word. Keep the promises. Amen. If you want it to be blessed, if you want it to be successful, you got to take the promise. Keep the word of the, of the law on your lips and meditate on it day and night. Amen. And before we finish up this morning, I want to bring three points. Amen. Before we close up. First is when, 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 when uh, Joshua and the Israelites were about to cross into the promised land. Amen. God say, remember this thing. Number one, be strong. And be very courageous. The Lord will be with you wherever you go. Amen. When we were in Egypt, the Lord wasn't there. Because God's presence cannot be dwelled with sinness. But when we are in the promised land, the presence of God will always be there. And sometimes we may not feel it. Sometimes we may not see God move. But God reminded Joshua, be courageous and be strong. I will always be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. And when the enemy comes to try to win you back, take you back to Egypt, remind yourself, be strong and be courageous. Jesus said to, the, uh, to his disciple, when the young rich ruler left and his face fell because he wasn't agreeing with what Jesus was saying to him to go and sell everything you have and then come and follow me. But then Jesus remind his disciple, he said to them, whoever left the field, left the home, left a father and a mother, a sister and brother, for my sake and the gospel, Jesus said, I will give it back to you, hundred folds, not only in this present life, but the life to come. And God is promising us this morning, Whatever the sacrifice that you have done to make it to your promised land, to experience the presence of God, the hard journey that you have come through, God says, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Point number two, remember to meditate on the Word of God day and night and be careful to do everything that is written in it. Amen. This is what God said to Joshua to communicate with the people. You know what, church? I read a few books about self-development, principle on how to become a better version of yourself. I read about secrets of millionaire success. I read about rich dad and poor dad. Amen. And I read through these books. They are all good books. They are very good books, very inspiring. But if you know your Bible, you read the principle that these guys are saying that they are secrets to be a better version of yourself. You read through these books, you looked at it, and I was like, oh, that's in the book of Proverbs. Oh, that's in the book of Exodus. Oh, that's in the book of uh, uh, Psalm. Oh, this is what Jesus had told his disciple. So for us Christians, God gave us this book. It's not, it's not a fairy tale or just a history book. This is God's manual. He's given to us. So as you read and meditate on it and you apply the promises, apply the principle that is written in it, God says you will be blessed and you will be successful. And I read through these books and I see the testimony of the people that apply those principles in their life and they actually become successful. And I was like, but man, us Christians, those books are written taking context of the Bible and they they think it's their own materials but in the Word of God it's got all the principle on how to become a better version of yourself and become a successful person but we are not applying it to our life amen and maybe that's the reason why God is not blessing us sometimes and not moving on our behalf because God says I've already given you the manual I've already given you 
the process on how to become a better version of yourself. And this is what God told Joshua to remember, meditate on the word day and night and be careful to do everything that is written on it and you will be blessed and be successful. Amen. Last point this morning. Point number three. Keep the law of God in your heart. Keep the law of God in your heart. You know, Jesus came and he simplified the law for us. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. Because if we looked at that mirror, that spiritual mirror, we see the standard of God's righteousness. There is no way I can live up to the standard of God's righteousness. Then when Jesus came, he lived that life as a righteous man, as the, as the perfect Lamb of God. And He took our place on that cross. And He died for your sake and my sake. And before He gave His last breath, He said, it is finished. There's no more work that we need to do. All we have to do is just put our faith in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we put our faith in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God will come and start working in us. And that's how we came to receive the love of God, the unconditional love of God, the agape love of God. And Jesus then simplified the law. And the law is all based on the love of God. He said, love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And love others as you love yourself. Amen. You know, something I noticed in, that, in, the, in, in the two commandments. Love God and love others as you love yourself. You know, sometimes we often love others. But the question, are you loving yourself? Are we forgiving ourselves? Are we letting go of the things that God tells us to let go so that we can be a better version of ourselves? Because when the Bible talks about forgiveness, it's not talking about the benefit of the other person. It's talking about your benefit. Because when you forgive, you're actually letting it go. You let go of the pain of what that person caused. But you're letting God work in your midst. And then as God starts to work, the fruits of the Holy Spirit will start to manifest in your life. And that's why when people looked at you, it was like, man, there's something about this man. There's something about this woman that I cannot describe. But let me tell you something. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That when people see the fruits of our life, the Bible says that they will glorify our Heavenly Father when they see our good deeds. Amen. But we cannot do it on our strength. We need the power of the Holy Spirit of God to move in us, to work in us. I cannot forgive on my own strength because... In my own strength, if I forgive and they, they do it again, I'm going to go back and pay back to them. But with God, the Bible says that Peter asks Jesus, Jesus, how many times I should forgive my brother? And Jesus say, not seven times a day, but seven times, 700 times. Amen. Seven times seven, 70. Amen. 490 times a day that we forgive. Amen. So there's no room for the enemy. There's no room for the enemy to take a foothold in our lives because God really wants to move in us. You know, why God wants us to be in that place so that He can showcase His power through you so that when the blessings comes in your life, we say to ourselves, man, I'm just a humble servant. I came with nothing just like Job. I came naked. I will return naked. But the, the name of the Lord be glorified in everything that I receive on this earth. In every accomplishment in life, I say, let God be glorified. I'm just a humble verse. But the reason why sometimes God haven't done that, because we're not ready to get to our promised land. Because historically, it's supposed to, the journey that's supposed to take only 11 days, it took the Israelites 40 years. Why? Because God was working in them, working constantly. I think there was some times too that God said, man, when is these people going to change their hearts? And that's why he told Moses, he said, Moses, I'm going to wipe these people off the face of the earth and I'm going to make another nation for you. But then Moses, a man that knows God's heart and he's a man of love, he said, God, if that's the case, take my name out of the book of life. He's a man that stood up that really showcased his love for others. Amen. As we love God. Amen. As I close up this morning, as I mentioned, Moses died in the wilderness, but his story didn't end there. 
because Moses actually set foot in the promised land. In the time when Jesus came and when he was on that mountain of transfiguration, who was there? Moses. And the other person was Elijah. And if we see it from a spiritual, spiritual perspective, Moses didn't make it to the promised land in the flesh because that signifies to us that we cannot make it to our promised land through the law, the work of the law, but through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that on that moment in the mountain of transfiguration, you find Moses on the other side and Elijah on the other side. And what happened to Elijah? He never died. He never went through death. He was lifted up. And that tells us, and who was in the middle? Jesus Christ. But that tells us, as we put our faith in Christ, the law kills, but grace, faith, will take you to your promised land. Amen. And as Jesus stood there, Peter was loving the moment, and he said, Jesus, let, let's, let's build tents here, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. But then Jesus say, no, we have a lot of work to do down there. We had a ministry. We had people to serve, that we have sickness to be healed, that we have demons possessed that needs to be cast out in the name of Jesus. There's so many people out there that needs to be saved, that needs to come to the grace of God. And now God is reminding us, when you make it to your promised land, when you experience God's presence and you feel the love of God, don't forget to share the love of God. Go out to the world and make disciples. Tell them the goodness of God and what God has done in your life. Because if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't even make it to this far. Let's all stand this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that the Word of God is for each and every one of us. As I study throughout this week, it speaks a lot of volume to me. And as I was uh, seeking the Holy Spirit of God and God was reminding me, never leave. Be courageous. Be strong. Do not be ter terrified. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God is with us right now. He's in our midst right now. Because Jesus Christ has already paid the price. And now He gives us the access to enter into the presence of God. The holy of holy. The place that the Israelites could not make it through because of the sin. But now you and I can enter into the holy of holy this morning without any hesitation because of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because what God shared with me and what the scripture says, it may hurt a few people. It may challenge a few people. But that's who God is. We sang, we worship God, that we love God. We worship God and say, He's a miracle worker. Amen. We sang it right now. But do you believe it? That's the challenge. But we've been with the Lord a long time and we understand. And the scripture that I'm coming to you from is uh, Malachi chapter 3. You, we all know it. We heard it many a times. But God revealed to me here, starting in, um, where is it? Verse 7. It says, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my ordinance. He's talking to his people. They turned aside from his commands, what he asked them to do. And then he says, and have not kept them. But he says here, return to me and I will return to you. He says, Jehovah of the host. God is saying, return to me. You have turned away from this time. Church, the issue when it comes to tithing, it's a big issue in people's lives because they don't understand what God can do, what God is available, what God is wanting to do. Yeah? So God is just reminding us, this church here, return back to Him. Remember His commands. Remember what He is saying to us today. But you say, wherein shall we return? 
Then he say, Will a man rob God? I say again, Will a man rob God? That's God saying, Yet you rob me. Now he's saying, If we're not giving what the word says, or if you're giving or you're giving his change, you are robbing God. You're robbing him. If you are a robber, you're a thief. You know a thief doesn't it doesn't go to heaven. He stays down here. You know where the thief comes from? The devil. He has he has stopped you up here. Acknowledging the word of God. You allowed the devil to get in here to stop you from giving from out of here. Why? Because it's become hard. Nothing's hard for God. He knows where you're at. He knows your struggles. He knows your pay packet. He knows the abundance that comes in your hand. He's not looking for the to change. He's not looking for nothing, just go and there's nothing in there. Don't forget, God sees you. He sees me. We can't fool God. No church, we have to wake up. We have to, if we say this is the best church in Melbourne, then prove it. Prove it to God. You don't have to prove it to me or Pastor Sarah. Prove it to God and say, yes, Lord, you come first. You come first. And then he says, quickly, I'm trying to hope for you. Then he says, you are cursed. With the curse, for you have robbed me. You are cursed. That's God's word. God is saying to you, reminding you, you are cursed. When you don't give what God has done to you. He don't need your money. He needs your faith. He wants your trust. Do you trust in God? If you say amen, say amen. If we believe in the word of God, say amen. Well, don't rob God. If you're here today and you have nothing, come before God and repent. Say, Lord, forgive me for robbing you. But from this day on, from the next time I come in, I'm not going to rob you. I'm going to give you what you deserve and more. And see what God will do. Because God said this. This is what he will do if you obey him. He said this. Bring the whole tide into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and prove me now that what it said. Jehovah of hosts. And I will not, I, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive it. There it is in a nutshell. There it is in a nutshell. God is saying he's ready to pour it out. But you have to pour in. You have to be faithful. Are you faithful, church? If you want to see a miracle in your life, not only you should, uh, uh, should have the giving, but your faithfulness is not only be in your church life, it'll be in your career, your, your, um, your family. There's, there's the blessing. We could not contain it. We've been robbing God too long, church. The day has come where there's no more. Every one of us is responsible. Don't jump on the coattail of, of a blessing of someone that's sitting next to you that's giving more and you sitting there giving nothing. Expect the blessing. Because you will not get the blessing because you have been cursed. But those who will give faithfully and believe it in the word of God, trust in the word, are going to be blessed. That's the way God works. But God wants you to be blessed. That's why he gave us the word. And I believe that's why God placed it on my heart for us. So as, uh, as we come to this, can we all stand, please? I'm going to pray for our tithes and offerings. As the ushers come around, 
if the word of God has spoken to your heart before I pray concerning the lack of giving, then take this moment to put it right with God this morning. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to forgive you. Because He's a forgiving God. He's not a, a, a perspective of persons. He don't favor no one. Why? This is important. A lot of people think it's not important, but it is. It determines our, our destination. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you for your word that sometimes we need to hear the truth and to bring us in line with you. Forgive us if we have robbed you. For many years, for many days, and thinking it was all right. Lord, you reveal today that it's not all right because a curse comes upon you, upon us. But Father, today, it's going to turn around. It's going to turn around. And Lord, that your blessing, yes, it's going to overflow on every family, every man, woman, and child that is, you have established in this house for the very fact that we trust in you and not in ourselves. We have faith in the God that we serve. When we're, when we're, when we're on, the, on the mountain and when we're in the valleys, when we have to look in the cupboard and we've got nothing to eat, but Lord, you will provide just like that. We won't even know where it's coming from, but we sure know it's going to come from heaven because that's who you are. So Father God, right now, I, I just pray a blessing. Lord, I pray a blessing. from the right to the left, from the front to the back, to every heart in this house. The blessing of Almighty God be upon us all. In your mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.